are you saying? We How much five? Price? I think five. And we we want to move people to quiet time and then prayer around the tables for just corporate. Okay, um, I was asked earlier to fill in books of value, and and uh, I so I did it. But I want to add to what she said. So to this ministry, I would highly have you read these two books. This is where um, T for T is what totally in the in the last 15 years totally changed church planting world. It was written by. Two Baptists, a, a Chinese and an American, and they planted 150 million churches and had two ba uh, two million baptisms over one decade in Southeast Asia. Everybody was taking interest in what they were learning. This is where three thirds comes from, and a lot of DMM and and all that T for T. And you heard Curtis say T for T. Blah, 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 blah. That's what he was talking about. And T for T stands for training for trainers. It's, it's, again, the idea that we have, too. It's like uh, multiply the leader. How do you multiply and train the trainer? That's where multiplication comes from. Get to the trainers, multiply them. Um, contagious disciple making is where you hear the term DBS. So <coughs> you'll hear three-thirds in this ministry a lot. That's how you do a meeting. Um, that's how you use a meeting that has looking back, looking up, looking forward with mission in it. That's three thirds. But but DBS is Discovery Bible Study, and Discovery Bible Study is what makes um, disciples making movements grow really quickly. So if because when you model it. The people that go through the Bible study, they go, I can do that. And most disciple-making movements, um, the DBS, I'll just give you an example of DBS. Um, God will refer to the bookmark. So here is the pursue path. You could literally go to the printer, print this. Did anybody already show this? No. No. And you'd have three three bookmarks. On one side, you'd have, you know, the 16 foundational Bible studies that we do. Okay, that's the pursue path, the, the first part of pursue. And on the other side of the the marker is this. It's DBS. So it's three thirds of your meeting. Literally, you come to the meeting with your Bible and this card. You, if you're really good at it, you can do that. In, in our app now and in our PDF version, there's more to it than just this, and I highly recommend you use the PDF version, not this. But this is an example of DBS. So you always ask, what are you thankful for? What difficulties have you faced? And what happened as you trusted God with your goals of uh, uh, I will by when statements? And it's like you're, you're locking into care, prayer, gratitude, worship, and mission right from the beginning. How did it go last week with your I will by when statements? Then you move to looking up. And this is what most people refer to in the DBS movement is ask someone to read the passage, ask someone to retell it, so that they can fix it in their memory. Like, just why don't you retell what you just read? Who would like to retell it? Retelling the scripture is big in DBS uh, disciple making movements. Anybody want to tell me why? Yes. Seven times seven ways. That's good. What do you mean by that? That's uh, Bob Lewis's thing that uh, he told us in communication. You have to. That's really good. 
Okay. Um, everybody has a different story and background, so what you're going to notice is when everybody, multiple people retell it, they're going to emphasize different parts of the story. If they have a different cultural background, they might emphasize something way different than me from my background. Okay. That's, that's another good reason. Yes? You learn it. You that learn it. And, 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 more, the and in your oikos, you can say, yeah, today we looked at a passage of scripture and they just say it. It, it can come into their witnessing language and everything. What is going on? Good computer shooting going. Shooting? Okay. And finally? And they can share it with their family and their friends yep. that day. And that That's right. Cool. So, but when you read the passages, what caught your attention and why? Why is this story important? What does it tell us about God, people, and us? And then how can we live differently in light of it? You learn those questions? And I mean people are discussing. And you're trusting the Holy Spirit to, to, to be the teacher. It's not like you pulling out the Greek and you know going long on this or that. It's you, you read the passage and you ask those questions. It's brilliant. And then looking forward is, are those questions. It's not important. I'm, I'm off, off kilter here. So contagious disciple making, it, it emphasizes that. It emphasizes this approach. Okay. Um, another couple of books are Spent Matches. It's written by uh, a friend of mine who is a national leader in the DMM, the Disciple Making Movement, which you heard that. So you've heard DBS, DMM, T for T. These are, this is slang for us. These are words we use all the time. DBS is Disciple Making. The, uh, discovery Bible study. That just means read the passage, retell it, share those questions, and, and that leads to discussion. DMM is disciple making movement. It's more of a concept. But in the DMM, uh, uh, Roy Moran in Kansas City is, and Spent Matches is a phenomenal book. And then From Mega Church to Multiplication by Chris Galanos. Excellent. You've heard it. It's excellent. It's really good especially for traditional churches that don't necessarily become house church planting churches, but they, they go through the metamorphosis of changing instead of just throwing the baby out with the bath water. And uh, Curtis mentioned him yesterday too. And then you've already heard about these two, Center Church and To Transform the City. And then you heard another one, which I forgot to put on there. If we can find it, we, we were looking last night, um, to uh, a biblical word for an urban world is he's the grandfather of it all in terms of this kind of book right he wasn't a part of the DMM but to transform a city he sure was okay so here's the, the last couple of things I'd like to, to say just about standing in, in the gap so I went through this yesterday so let me just let me just finish by saying a couple of things about prayer and going practical here. Um, in Kansas City, uh, I was a reading tutor for Cherry, Asia, Alasia, and a Angel over a five, six year period. I fell in love with Angel. Six years old, cutest gal you'd ever want to see from a Title I public school. And uh, and I, I just can't tell you how my heart broke one day when, after months of being her tutor, she didn't come back, and I was like, "Where's Angel?" And, oh, you didn't hear, and and no, uh, her daddy came home uh, three days ago and threw her mom up against a brick pole in their in their house, broke her back, and now she's with her grandparents in North Kansas City, and she won't be coming back to the school. And uh, about that time, uh, a woman named, um, escaping me, help me, Lise, the uh, link. No. Uh, she was in Cal Bay Casey from Olathe, Indian Hills, Gary Kendall's friend, led the reading, the church school partnership. Church Keenan? Yeah. Yeah. Terry Keenan? Nancy Mitchell? Who's that? Nancy Mitchell. She shared this verse with me once. It's like, in this process, she goes, Arise, cry in the night, as the watches of the night begin. 
pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint from hunger at every street corner. And she would just weep, you know, for the children of Kansas City. And I never really understood it until I was a reading tutor for a number of years. And Karen and I, you know, when we when we drove off out of our, out our first two um, reading things, uh, 45 minutes from our house, not strategic, but we were trying to create a new Boycos for us. And um, we were like weeping, can you believe we're 52 years old and we've never done anything like this? And it's so key to understanding our city and, and the heart of God and all that. And I remember, you know, thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, a few of you guys in here have led over big swaths of land that like Larry and Debbie have. And, and you know, high visionaries, you know, like geographical and let's go and faceless nations that you got to get the gospel to, which I'm a big, big believer in. Um, but I, I had this thought, um, does God that tells us to go to the ends of the earth that sent his son to die on the cross and all that. Does he have a heart? I mean, a really huge heart for Angel to learn to read before she's in the third grade. And I would, I would, yes, he does. He has a vision for it. And I just started pounding that in Kansas City. You know why, why I know he has one? I mean, I can turn to a lot of scripture like this. But I have one for my grandkids. Just think how terrible it would be for them if they didn't know how to read up until the third grade. Because up until then, you're, you're learning to read, but after that, you read to learn. And if you can't keep up in the fourth and fifth, you get upset, you have bad self-esteem, anger, bitter, you start throwing things in class, you become a riot in the class and, and all that. And the church, we can mobilize for that. But it doesn't matter. We learn to... My point is, we were learning to stand in a gap we had never been in before, and standing in the gap is part of our call. But we have to mobilize the church for when built in to get there, and we we did. We didn't just we just weren't reading tutors. But um, Isaiah or Ezekiel twenty two thirty says, "I look for someone among them who would build up a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I would not have destroyed, but I found no no one." I know we've wept over this verse this week. I'm not feeling weepy right now. But the word picture painted in this verse is that of a wall with a gap in it, with a hole, if you would, in it. And of course, a wall back in those days was the best means of protection for the people of the city. And so a breach in the wall would let the enemy through and it would you know, make them vulnerable. And if there was a breach in the wall, the defenders of the city would would swarm to that location and hold the breach. And that's the picture you see here. The gap would need to be repaired as soon as possible because if it was left unattended, the city would fall. So this is kind of a picture here when we say of standing in the gap. In the New Testament, um, we're told to pray for others in this passage. So in God's sovereign wisdom, he has chosen uh, to use his people's prayers to accomplish his will. He, he still seeks those who will stand in the gap for friends and family and for groups and nations like Abraham did or, or Moses who would be willing to stand in the gap asking God to spare and asking God to save. And that's what we're about. There's a lot of barriers to, to us not praying as a ministry. Um, these are some of them. Um, we don't believe in a spiritual foe, so we just kind of lollygag through our ministry. We don't have a proper view of ourselves that, that we are the branch and we're to abide in prayer. We're to abide in him, in faith and trust in the promise keepers that have asked me what you will and, and it will be done for you. This is a, this is a view that we need to have in ourselves. We're abiders, we're, a, we're the branch. The title of our book is The Outrageous Promise. And in that, in that, in chapter 12, or 14, verse 12, it says, um, Jesus is standing with his disciples and said, this is upper room discourse. 
I mean, tomorrow night he's he's dead. <coughs> Next night he's he's gone. He's it's it's black weekend. Um, and he goes, uh, hey, you know, it'd be like a group like this here. The works that I do, that you've seen me do, and their their heads are populating with, oh, I saw him do this and that and that. It's just miracles. You will do also. In fact, greater works than these will you do, because I go to the Father. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And he said it again. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will send you another helper, the, the, the Holy Spirit. And he will not only be uh, with you, he'll be in you. And so in this little passage, there's a great little sermon outline. There's a call to greater works, a companion, and there's a condition. And the only point I want to draw out here is the condition of greater works is prayer. If you pray. So it's like, who's doing the work? You said, I would do the works you do. Yeah, it'll be a partnership. It'll be an unequal partnership. I'm going to do them through you. But you've got to be a person of prayer. And so this is a little food for thought. Um, on the practical side, I was grateful for the time this morning when Neri and uh, Bonnie were saying, we're getting practical today. And I go, God, I'm not prepared to get practical. So <clears throat> I sat down on my computer and wrote out what I do in my prayer life when I'm at my absolute stud best, you know, you know, but, but this is what I would recommend is that there's a personal side to you having a prayer plan. <clears throat> and I know we all have one. The practice for me that has gotten me the furthest along is uh, this prayer journal idea. So in my time with God, In my uh, time with God, I, I, in those seven years of hiatus, I noticed there were, there were uh, four kinds of prayers. And, and this is one. There, it's all under the idea of worship. And I noticed that I wasn't praying consistently. And, and so I thought, I'm going to get out. I'm going to get a prayer journal, <coughs> a journal out, normal, you know, writing journal, split it out in four ways. And I'm going to put my focus definitions of what I should be doing in my own language th that in case I drift and I'm no longer worshiping or praising God, these phrases will jumpstart my heart. And, I, and I, these are my definitions of worship. And I put them in the, in the front of my journal. And I would follow it with <coughs> hymns, poems, uh, devotional thoughts, any scriptures that would get me going outside of my Bible reading. It'd be like, I want to sing sometimes, I want to read this poem sometimes. And I've, I've done 18 journals since then. You know, I, they get cold and the pattern dries my heart out and and I just, I don't throw it away, I put it away and I, I, I do another one. But at the front of every one is these focus definitions. So I have Worship, and then it's followed by worship. Then I have confession. This is confession. And in the in the in my prayer time, uh, that study, it was uh, agreeing mournfully with God about your sin, admitting with regret that it was wrong. Do you confess that way, <coughs> or is it like uh, John one twelve? Uh, thank you, God, that you forgive me. No, don't talk flippantly to the Holy One about your your sin. So it's also here, somewhere. There it is. Humbling yourself before God. And it's like, it just jumps, it's like, Dave, are you confessing, or have you gone another week without confessing sin? Another week. Another two weeks. A month. You know, let's be honest here. You ever gone a month without confessing sin? I have. I mean, kind of. But, anyway. Uh, intercessory, intercessory prayer, you know, and then resistance. These are not prayers to Satan, by the way, <laughs> like some false teachers are out there. These are prayers offered to God that express the need for his protection and deliverance because you know Satan's around you. Just like, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus is praying to God. 
the Father with Satan in mind. So there's resistance prayers. So that's kind of, for me, the personal side of developing a plan. You, you, you develop your own. You know, it'd be, be good. Um, and then I mentioned yesterday this 10 times prayer warrior covenant group. Work on developing your own covenant group that's, that knows you like Cray and you trust them. One of the women in my group, her name is Elizabeth Dungan, and she's got a different theology from me. <coughs> she's charismatic, um, tongues talker, prophetic, all of that, but she's my friend. And she's under the authority of her husband. She always gives me a word and says, don't trust it, just you, you, you take it to God. You know, but, but she reads me like a book. She has so much, and, and sometimes I turn to her and just go, are you getting any, any uh, when you pray for me, Oh, I do. I'm so glad you asked. You know, and then she'll, she'll say something. I'll go, golly, that, that's so hell. And she'll pray for me. Just, just develop your own covenant group. So on the community or your OECO side, when I say community, I don't mean your Christian community here. I mean on your outreach side, a lot of people take prayer walks. Now, this is not a, a habit for me yet. Um, I, I do drive walks. It, that's, that's our true incarnational ministry in car national uh, that's unfortunately that's that's what the church thinks incarnational means like let's go do a food drive we don't want to follow it up but we'll go right back to applebee's um right around the corner you know it's like but but you can prayer prayer drive your city your team you know just if you have a team just make room for prayer just make room for it in your meetings Sometimes it gets crowded out for good reasons, but, but if it goes too long that way, it's, it's not good. You know, make, make room. Uh, take the prayer, worldwide day of prayer day seriously. We do in Kansas City. Uh, and then when you're one-on-one -on -one with each other, let's prayer. <laughs> Just, <get, laughs> Just say to each other, let's pray. That's a typo. Let's prayer. Uh, <laughs> And, and I, I don't, and you have to get past that. I'm not trying to one up you spiritually here, bro. And, and you're not doing that to me. Let's pray. We're, we're, we're children of God. Let's pray. Let's, yeah, let's pray. Sanders is really good at this. Can I pray for you before we go? You bet. You know, I can tell you're like this. But anyway. Uh, and then citywide, join a pastors and covenant group or a city gospel movement like when we met Nancy Mitchell and Gary, uh, Schmitz. what's Schmitz. wrong with my mind? Gary Schmitz. Gary Schmitz. Gary Schmitz. I mean, th there's just a lot you can learn from these people, but you can go and pray with them. That's my talk. This is, um, this is sort of how, this is a really corny illustration. My kids would go, Dad. You should not have showed that slide. But uh, the, it's the, the fuel for our ministry, when we think of developing leaders and connecting, multiplying, partnering, develop, you know, is it's prayer. That's, that's, it's just got to be foundational. It's got to be our canopy, our covering, our, our companion, everything about it has to be prayer. And so I would say, uh, I'm going to follow Bonnie's exhortation here. Um, what we... I guess what we'd really encourage you to do is just pray with us. But before, let's close our time in prayer. And, and you know, Bonnie and, and uh, Neri, thanks for what you've done here today. I mean, really wonderful. Had a Q&A time. <laughs> but is it okay? Am I supposed to be closing it? Okay, I'm just wondering. Uh, why don't you take... Um, we don't need a, a silent minute. You've had a lot of those, but before we just pray corporately, is there anybody that wants to say a quick anything the Holy Spirit's nudging you to speak or ask a question? Just brief. We want to be brief. Everybody's? No? Okay. Why don't we thank God for today and for the week and what we're experiencing, what we need. Uh, 
And like D.L. Moody said, most people's prayers need to be cut short at both ends and set on fire in the middle. I'm a big believer in that. Uh, so <coughs> just, just something you want to say, pray it out. And then we'll give room. And you can come back and pray again if you want. So let's